I, I'll go, I, I'll go I, wherever, wherever one, you guys want to go. I don't care. I, <laughs> I, I, I for one, am a, a big fan and, um, you know, I, I'm really happy to meet you and, um, I want, Jamie and, and Rob, obviously, to, to catch up and talk with you. But I have stuff I want to talk to you about that's outside of The Sopranos, which cool. if, that, if that's all right, I mean, we can that's get into great. that. Yeah. Let me ask you, what's your guys' relationship? How do you, how do you Jamie, uh, Jamie Lynn, and, and Robert know you? Me and Robert did a pilot, I don't know how many years ago, but we just got on really well, uh, me, Rob, and Joe Perino. And uh, we got to be fast friends and, and um, just stayed in touch, you know, and, uh, and then Rob introduced me to Jamie and my life has been so much better with Jamie. And <laughs> I'm sure that. <laughs> sure that. And are you in California? Yeah. You are, I'm, yeah. I'm in uh, Los Angeles, much Andrew. like these other guys here. Yeah. Okay. We didn't even say it yet, but in case anybody is tuning in and doesn't know our guest, this is uh, yeah. <laughs> lucky enough to have Michael Imperioli this week, guys. You have such a... Um, I always admire people that have such a like very distinct voice. It's I'm trying to find like all the adjectives, the proper adjectives. They're all wonderful, like to describe your voice, but it's 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 such a good one. Thank I feel you. like if pe huh? people we didn't introduce them, they they'd know who we were talking to. Uh, maybe you never know. Yeah, are you, are, <laughs> is this going out live or you're taping? What, what, no, you no, know? it's not live. No, yeah. And you don't? Do you allow? I mean, I usually don't, but sometimes I slip profanities. Is that should, I should steer away from that or what? Whatever you slip them, slip them right here. in. You should have heard Dre. I, I I'm not planning on it, and I don't usually, but once in a while, you know, something strikes. Well, yeah. So speaking of profanities, this is when I was like, you know, looking up stuff uh, about you, I saw all these different things came up about how you died in movies. Uh, one of my favorite movies when I was like 11 years old was Dead Presidents. I, I loved it. And I couldn't talk to anyone else in like my fifth grade class about it because they weren't allowed to watch it, I guess. I was, uh, <laughs> they shouldn't have been allowed, Robert. <laughs> I don't know why you were watching. But then you were on The Sopranos when you were 12, so. Right. You were, he had a weird childhood. You had a weird least. childhood. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was weird. And I remember your scene in that movie, you say, you, know, you guys are, is it Vietnam? It was supposed to be Vietnam. We shot it in, believe it or not, the jungle scenes we were shot in Orlando. And like, there's actually woods in Orlando that look like that. We oddly yeah. enough, yeah, jungly. So yeah. you say, "I'm going to take a shit." You're gone for too long. They start worrying about you. They go looking for you. They find you with your intestines cut out, right. and they cut your dick off and yeah. put it in your mouth. Apparently, they you know they did that in Vietnam as a you know to scare people to scare the. Uh, <laughs> The enemy, um, that'll certainly do it, right? Yeah. yeah. So what, they made a gigantic prosthetic, though. It was <laughs> it was almost like ridiculous. <laughs> well, that's that's actually what I wanted to ask about. Was like, I feel like when you're on set, a lot of times, like the scene that you're doing can dictate what's going on on set. You know, if it's not a serious mm -hmm. scene, or if you're having a good time on set, you're having a good time. If somebody's dying the day takes a different note. It's, it's way more serious. Mm -hmm. So what is it like when you're dying, but in kind of a ridiculous way like that? Um, it takes on the, you know, the element of ridiculous, you know, um, and, you know, it's such a weird, disturbing thing to, to do. You have to find a way to just make it simple and, and not, um, overthink it you know um you know like i get asked a lot about like the scene when tony kills you in the sopranos like it wasn't my last day on set so it didn't have that feeling you know my last day was like a week or two even two later i don't even remember but i know that wasn't my last. i remember it was some kind of non very inconsequential scene my actual last one on the set and that was a very emotional day because it was my last scene the actual scene when he kills me wasn't I can't say it was tremendously emotional. I remember the stuntman flipped the car and went down the hill. That was really the big deal of the day. The fact that there was a, you know, there was a guy who took that 
crash and went flying in the air, went rolled down the hill. You know, he was strapped in like crazy and, and actually did that. I mean, to me, that was way more weighty, you know, and, 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 and bigger than, than anything we were doing in the car. But a lot of times those difficult things as an actor, you just have to just make them simple, you know? Like I'd be more emotional if someone else was dying. Like, like on our show, it was like someone died. That meant you weren't going to see them at work the next day, which was really right. sad. It wasn't even so much the scene to me that's disturbing because we see all the smoke and mirrors and the wires and how everything's done. So, like, I don't like violent movies. I'll be honest. I don't like watching violence in movies because it disturbs me. But like actually doing it in a movie you see the choreography and you see the fake blood and all that. So you don't get the effect. So it's not that disturbing. Kind of clinical. Yeah. Yeah. So knowing that, and I know you wrote some uh, episodes of the Sopranos as well. Um, were you involved in the writing process of your own death or if not, like how, how long ahead did you know that you you had a final episode coming up? Um, was it, something that you had time to like sort of emotionally kind of prep for, or, you know, did it kind of come as a surprise to you? Um, I wasn't writing the last, I don't, I don't think I wrote in the last two seasons. So um, I think the last episodes I wrote were in season five. Um, so I wasn't involved in the writing of it, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. David told me a long time before. And I, I, Sounded really cool to me. I mean, and, and, you know, all his choices were always the right ones. I think David Chase. Yeah. What, what was it like to be writing on the show that you were actively in and, and did it, do you feel like, um, you know, did, did it feel like you had sort of like, you were able to see both sides of the sort of same coin and, and did it, help you in any way or was it harder than you might think it'd be what's that like oh it's definitely hard i mean it, writing yeah. is always hard um i mean i have much more experience as an actor although i i have been writing for a lot of my life you know adult life but you know acting is hard i mean it's it, it's it's a skill that not everybody could do and it takes a while to get good at it but at least you kind of know what you have to do right you have the script. <laughs> yeah. So you basically know where you got to be and what you got to say and what you're doing. Writing, you, ha you start with a blank page. You don't very often don't know what you're going to do. I just read an interview with Kurt Vonnegut and he, he said, a quote, he goes, the best writing he does, he, he does or did because he's, he's gone now is always when he didn't know what he was doing, which I feel like is very <laughs> often with writing. Um, but I, I started writing for the show because during the shooting of season one, I was an actor and I fell in love with the show and I fell in love with all the characters and all the actors and, and the show itself. I just so loved it that I was, you know, filled with passion to write for it. So in between season one and season two, I wrote a spec script. You know, my desire to write was not to like dictate or be the architect of Christopher's, you know, storylines and his, you know, evolution of the character. It was just really out of a love for the whole, the show as a whole, you know, I think my favorite character, favorite character to write for was uncle junior, even more than Christopher. Uh, so that's really what, what drove me. And it was very hard. Um, I had never written for television. I'd done, written some screenplays before. And, you know, there was a bit of a learning curve because television's more concise than movies, you know, it's shorter, and it's a very collaborative medium because there's storylines before you and storylines after you and you're right. part of a team. So, um, but it was great. I did mean, you, I did you write your spec script like kind of in secret and then just show up with it one day? Or did you tell David like, Hey, is it cool if I do this? And like, you just tell me if you like it or not, and maybe I can write some more. Like how, how did that work? I wrote it in between seasons down, during when we were down and at some point before the season I gave it to him and I invited him to a screening of the Spike Lee movie Summer Sam that I was co-writer of so um, and between those two things he liked what I did enough to um, actually 
part of the spec script, I had Christopher OD and then have visions of the afterlife. And he said, well, season two, Christopher's going to get shot. So we can use that afterlife sequence stuff, you know, after he gets shot. And that's kind of how it evolved. Cool. I don't know if you know, but these two haven't even seen the show. I'm I'm watching it right now. She's currently Where are you? watching. Where slowly, are you? slowly. I'm in the middle of season two. Middle of season two. Okay. Yeah. But I'm with you. Like I have fallen in love with every character. I, I just I'm I'm so grateful that I waited this long because I just feel like I'm at an age and in a time in my life where I can have a greater understanding and appreciation. I always knew how great everyone was, but man, it's just like from down to just the one-liners, everyone's just so spot on. It's so great to watch. No, you know, I'm with you. I mean, I, I get asked a lot in interviews, like, why do you think the show is such so successful? And then when um, I spoke to David after we put out a press release that Steve and I were doing this podcast and he called and he, he, he liked the idea. He was, he just said, I want to, you know, I want to come on. I gave us his support. And I was saying, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing it is like, there's all these young people who are now addicted to the Soprano, obsessed. You go mm -hmm. on Instagram, there's meme sites and quote sites and fashion sites. And I'm talking teenagers and twenties and thirties. Yeah. And David said, why is that? And I said to him, you know, I don't mean to be flippant, but it's cause it's very, very, very good. That's one of the reasons yeah. I could, you could go and say the mob and it's an outlaw, but it's family and there's the loyalty and, the, and there's all those elements. But not every mob movie is, you know, watched by millions over and over and over again. You know, a mm -hmm. couple of them are the best ones like Godfather and Goodfellas, but, you know, in the hands of two of the greatest filmmakers ever. Right. That's why, you know, it's not because yeah. it's a mob movie. It's because it's De Niro and Pacino and Brando and Coppola and Scorsese and Joe Pesci. And the same thing with The Sopranos. It's because it's David Chase and James Gandolfini and Edie Falco and Jamie Lynn Sigler and Robert Eiler. And, you know, it's just very, very, very good on every level. Time out. We just wanted to take a second out of the show to, um, hey, it's our, we have our very first sponsor, Robbie. Can you believe it? Um, I can believe it because I'm sitting there way right now. <laughs> today's episode of Pajama Pants is brought to you by Manscaped. They're the best in men's below-the-belt grooming and they offer precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Robbie there is holding it up. Um, look, I've had a terrible experience trying to groom myself. I had a, um, I'm going to call it an incident when I was about 17 years old and I was working retail and I had a girl tell me, I don't know what she meant by this, but she's like, you know, if you, if you trimmed down there, it might make it look a little bigger. And I, and I said, Oh, Oh, definitely. Like that's definitely something I'm interested in. I've been searching for something like that my entire life. Not only did I think trimming would make it bigger, but I said, if I just completely shave my pubes, it'll look huge. So I bicked all my pubes off. Wait, is that why you, is that why you keep the mustache to make your nose look smaller? Exactly. It, it <laughs> takes away, it takes away the attention from the nose, the glasses and the mustache do that. So for a week, after I shaved everything with a razor, I had the worst itch and rash. And when I was working at Best Buy, I um, couldn't stop scratching it. So if I, if you bought a like a, a TV or like a, a receiver from a uh, pimply faced young kid at Best Buy who had his hand in his pocket scratching furiously, that was probably me. And I'm sorry. And I wish things like Manscaped were around back then because. I had to use my dad's face trimmer to take the top layer, and then I went in with a shaver. Um, so it's a blessing. It's an absolute honor to have Manscaped on the podcast today. And listen, because Kasim's nose looks so perfect on his face, we have a lot of female viewers and, and listeners, and they're going to be saying, well, how do, why would I buy a Manscaped? You could buy it for your boyfriend. You could mm -hmm. buy it for your dad. Father's Day is coming up. You buy it for your dad. If I had... Yeah, buy your dad some pube trimmer. Listen, if I had a dollar for every <laughs> pube trimmer I bought my dad, I would have enough money to buy him another manscape. And then when I give it to him, he'd say, why are you giving me this? I already have it. I would hand it to him. I'd be like, here you go, daddy. Here's the present, daddy. Yeah. I love you. 
And then listen, if you think we're full of shit, my favorite podcast, they were promoting uh, Manscaped and I went and used their promo code and got the 2.0. This is back. Can I just tell you, I feel the diff. I'm not, I sound like a salesman right now, but yeah. I'm not even, I, Sell feel, it. I feel a big difference with this one in my hand when it's vibrating than I do. When yeah. This the new one looks, uh, it's larger. It's got an led light on it to shine, uh, illuminate the situation uh, a little bit. Cause it, it can just be all like a, a dark rat's nest down there. If you're not, you know, um, in a well lit area and they also, you know what they say? You should trim all that junk off your junk. Rob, I know Manscaped appreciates it. Um, we appreciate you guys who have been asking us how to support the podcast. And this is it. This is we don't have, we don't sell merch. We don't uh, we don't we haven't asked for money in any sort of way. No Patreon. If you guys like pajama pants and you want to support the show, just go to manscaped.com, Use the code PJ Pants and get twenty percent off your first order. That's it. That's that's the way. That's the way you help us out. And then you get uh, a cool ball trimmer, you know. Because sometimes behind the pants, things get a little out of control, and you, and you need to take care of it, even if it's to make it look a little bigger. Yeah, twenty percent off. The code is PJPANTS. Yep, Manscaped.com promo code PJPANTS. And back to the show. Yeah. So people people always ask us like. Did you know Sopranos was going to be big? And it's like, well, no, because no, you, you didn't. You didn't know what to expect. But when you do something like, I think it was like a year after your first movie, you did Goodfellas. So it's like Pacino. I mean, uh, it's De Niro. It's Pesci. It's Scorsese. Like you know, right? Oh, I knew that was the big leagues. Yeah, because I mean, for me, that that was the. You know, Scorsese and, and De Niro were, were, were part of the reason I became an actor. Those movies like Raging right. Bull, which I saw in the movie theaters, I think I was 14. And that just totally blew my mind. I'd never seen a movie like that. And um, so those guys, you know, I grew up on that. And it, it was part of my inspiration to be an, an actor. So that was a big deal for me. Yeah. Was so what was that? What was that audition like? How do you remember getting the phone call? Like, yeah, you got the role. Well, I had just started doing, I did the, a movie Lean on Me with Morgan Freeman that uh, John Albertson, who directed Rocky, made. And that was my first movie, 1988. We shot it. I had one line, which was, my line was, hey, I'm going to be a star. That was my line. But I was so nervous that I mumbled it every take and they cut it out because I was I had never been in front of a camera before. I'd only been in acting class for years since I was 17. So many years in class doing scenes. I'd done a couple of plays, but I'd never been in front of a camera. And I didn't, really didn't know what I was doing. I knew how to act, but I didn't know how to act in front of that camera just right there. It was a whole other yeah. trip. And the director was very impatient and he really was not, He, he I think he was overwhelmed and he, he I had one line in a scene with a lot of other kids and there was 500 teenagers in the auditorium and he had no time for me and it was horrible. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> and then I did two other little indies. I had a couple of lines, which were, nobody saw these movies. They were okay. But then, so then I get the audition for Goodfellas. I had an agent at the time who was getting me auditions finally. And um, I, I read the book wise guy by Nick Pileggi and um, every all the guys got this, a scene, Joe Pesci's scene. And I thought I was auditioning for Joe Pesci's character, Tommy. Because in the book, Tommy's like 21 or 23 or something. Yeah, how old were you at the time? Because you look like 20, a baby. 20, 23. Yeah. So I thought I was auditioning for that. And I, all the guys had to read Joe Pesci's lines for, I forget which scene, not the spider scene, another scene. But I knew that Scorsese liked improvisation, so I improved a lot in the scene, and he loved it. First for the casting director, and then she brought me back to meet Marty, and he loved what I did. But uh, I didn't know I was auditioning for that part. I was actually disappointed because I thought I was auditioning for the lead, and I didn't get it. <laughs> That's how, like, nuts I was or deluded. And, um, but I was very happy to get a part in the movie and yeah. you didn't really get the script. He didn't give the script out. It was just the scenes in the book I remembered. And, um, 
when I got to the set, he was like, came right in my, uh, I was brought to him on set and he said, um, the costume guy put me in like a waiter's white shirt with a black tie and an apron and stuff. And Scorsese grabbed the guy and says, what are you doing? This isn't a legitimate establishment. Don't, don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't dress him like a waiter. He, he's dressed him like one of the guys. And then he said to me, uh, if you need anything, you have any questions, you need to talk. There's my trailer. Come and see me, you know, which was, um, you know, the last big director I worked with didn't give me the time of day. And here's Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. you know, saying, if you need me, knock on my door. And, um, he said to me, just treat the actors like the character on and off camera. Which I really liked because it took all the pressure off. Now I'm not just this actor who's in awe of these guys. I, I can just be this guy who's working in the club waiting on them, which yeah. was actually great for me. And um, I remember telling the prop guy, I want, and I don't know what, how I had this instinct, but I said to the prop guy, I want to be in charge of resetting the props at the table between takes. And Marty was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let the kid do it. Let the kid do it. And I was like, you know, which in hindsight, I never would do that. Like today I would never probably ask sure. the prop guy. The prop guy does what he does and I do my thing, but I didn't know. And then there's a bar and I'm behind the bar, but the liquor bottles were behind me. So if I were to make, be making a drink, I'd have to have my back to them. I said, no, you have to put all the bottles in front of me. So when I'm making a drink, I can watch them because I have to make sure I, you know, if they need me, I got to be on top of it. And they changed all that around. Now I'm not, now I'm doing props and set decorating. Right. <laughs> <laughs> on a Martin Scorsese movie. Um, and they let me do all that shit. And then yeah. and when you look at the movie, there's a shot of me making a drink from their point of view. And I'm like smiling when De Niro's going, don't take any shit. And I'm kind of smiling. Right? So if I had my back turned making drinks that, shot wouldn't have happened probably yeah um so they, cool and, and, and all of them felt all of them treated me like that I, they treated me like an actor like i belong there and because that experience if it was bad could have really destroyed me you know and it yeah. was the opposite i wonder if that's how you like have the comfort in going to someone like david chase like hey i wrote a script right because martin scorsese was so that's part of it. I'm sure that that gave me a lot. That, and I know that that gave me a lot of confidence that if this guy's treating me like an actor and with respect, mm -hmm. like I belong there and letting me improv. I mean, every take we did was different. They did. He stopped me go and go and go. I remember when I first started rehearsing because we spent like half the morning, half the day rehearsing, which you never do on a movie set. I mean, you're. You're on a movie set, it's always like, we got to get the shot, get the scene. We're doing five scenes, move locations. We shot one scene one day, one the other day. And the first half wow. of the day was rehearsal, which is like beautiful, but never happens. Um, and I was playing him more like a wise ass in the, in the first rehearsal. And, and Marty came over to me and said, you know, I think this guy's a little slow. <laughs> so that's then. So then I kind of gave this stutter and that's how that happened to kind of communicate him a wow. little slow. Not that having a stutter means you're slow. I just, no, it was the choice I made in the moment. And yeah. And he liked that. So that's you, great. Cause if I would have got that note and I would have made the choice to add a stutter, I would have spent all day trying to perfect a stutter <laughs> in my trailer, you know, like, <laughs> but there's I, no time. We'll there's no time. I mean, Maybe that's, that's just how talented, you know, you have to be and, and, and you are, it's just, uh, You've got to be able to make really bold choices and then also execute those bold choices because if not, you could look terrible. Yeah. Every actor we've talked, we've spoken to, I feel like on this podcast, um, and they tell the stories of when like something great happened or they booked a great role or they, it's always when they're just like going with their gut and just being like, I can't believe I did that. Or I, I don't know who I, it's, it's always that when you're just uninhibited and going with your instinct. And I just, it's, it's, no. it's such a lesson to be reminded of that. It's, you know, that's when the magic happens because like you said, we're artists and people respond to that. It's no threat to anyone. When you want to have an opinion, it doesn't have to be right. You don't have to choose it, but it just keeps things flowing. It's really cool. Yeah. And, and to have to, I think to have that, 
to be to feel comfortable enough to take those risks and 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 you know be creative and and take chances like that you have to feel safe and comfortable and that's what yeah Mar, that's why marty's a genius because he creates that atmosphere on set where it's right. like play you know it's like yes 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 it's not like you know let's go let's you know what i mean let's do it you know i think that's part of his genius is that he creates mm -hmm. an atmosphere where people feel safe to be creative because nothing shuts you down as an actor more than when someone's being short with you when there's yelling when people are being abusive to each other when there's stacked tension, you close. You don't want to take a chance. You don't want to, you know, step out a lot. You know, you just want to just do what the minimum is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Do you, do you find that it's better to walk onto a set having made some pretty big choices and then just trying them and seeing if the director responds and then maybe scaling it back if it's too big or too much, or do you find walking onto set doing like a sort of mild read through and then adding on top of it, anything that the director thinks it might, I mean, what, what's your, what's your thought? What's a better choice if there's any actor listening of, of how to approach a scene on, on a set that they're on? Well, the more prepared you are, the better. So if you have some things that you know you want to try, even if you may not ever get to them or you may not get to them at first, it's good to have. Because so then you get, you know, the thing, the thing about movies and especially movies cause, uh, and TV as well, it's like you never totally know till you get there how things are going to play out right because you envision it one way and then you get there and the set's a little different and you're actually 20 feet away from the other actor and you thought you were going to be one foot away you know so you always have to adjust to where it is you know and then you're, you're by a highway so you got to yell you can't whisper you know there's always that kind mm -hmm. of adjustments that always need to be made but um so i think it's always good to be prepared but you may you know you have to read the room almost and just say you know, uh, this works as is pretty well. You know, some scenes don't need, like we hardly, we pretty much never improvise on The Sopranos. We weren't really encouraged to, and it, it was, it was, you weren't really allowed to, and you didn't have to, because the scenes right. worked really well, you know? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, well, you let's mention it. You're doing a podcast called Talking Sopranos with Steve Sharp, and you guys are going episode by episode. How do you feel revisiting each episode? How long has it been since you've watched the show? Have you watched the show recently? I mean, how's that been? I haven't watched. There's one reason why we wanted to do the podcast and thought it might be interesting because neither Steve nor I have watched it since the initial airings. Mm. So... Um, it's it's big, you know. I mean, Jim's gone, and and there's other, you know, Nancy's gone, and John Patterson's gone, and and uh, uh, John Hurd is gone. There's people who are not with us anymore, so it's bittersweet. I mean, it's more sweet than bitter because I'm yeah. a lot of happy memories, and I'm really proud of the work we did. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's interesting watching yourself back then, you know, and like what what I would have done. I'm, for the most part, I'm very happy with. My performance in it, there was one episode in season one that I watched where a lot of the scenes I was like, oh, no, you totally <laughs> missed this. I, I no. really, I, Yeah, like one episode, I, I really liked what I did. And the next episode, I'm like, oh, wow, you were way off. Here. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really questioning why I played it the way I did. For the most part, I like it, what I did. But there was a couple of scenes where I was like, uh-uh. Yeah. But that's that's probably why I haven't watched it in a long time, right. too, you know? Sorry, How do you feel about that when you, when watching yourself after all these years, both of you, how, how has it been? Well, I'm still in the early years. So I feel like I was still at such at an age where I was um, purely instinct and just kind of faking it till I made it and like trying to keep up. And it, it, it's almost like serves you better, you know, because you're just, you're not so wrapped up in your thoughts and I was playing someone young and I was young at the time. So it was sort of, it, things felt familiar, but I'm like, I'm worried of watching myself when I get to later seasons, when I know that like things like where you're saying, where you kind of close up, those were years for me where I started like closing up a bit in just 
of just life. And so I know I'm probably going to have moments where I'm like, oh, but that being said, I was supported and surrounded by, like we said, the best writing and best actors. So, you know, maybe no one else will notice as hopefully as much as I, I'm sure I will, but it's, 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 um, it definitely was like confidence building for me to watch it and just be like, Oh, I, you know, because as an actor, you go through moments where you're like, do I even know what I'm doing anymore? I'm trying, you know, <clears throat> through all these years. And I, it's, it's nice to kind of watch and see when you're so young and feel like you had like a knack for it. Like it is something that's truly within you, you know? Well, I met a, really evolved over the course of the show. I mean, became an adult. Sure. I mean, cause th that season one, which I just, today I just watched uh, the finale of season one for the second time to, uh, this week. And season one Meadows, like the, you know, just that teenager who's over everything and the, just can't oh, yeah. her parents and just, you know, nasty and bad moods and all the, I mean, she's, and, the, but that was really then. And you totally became an adult and mature and more. Yeah. You, know, you went through that phase, which is, that's what teenagers do. They go through that phase. Totally. Right? Um, I remember I had a moment with you, Michael, when you wrote, you wrote what you wrote one of the episodes. Was it when the first episode, Steve Shemi came in? Did you write that one? Maybe, maybe. I, I don't remember. I, yeah, I remember you were, you were behind the monitor and there was like this scene where I was like, saying to Carmela that I was like looking for like a cake pan or something to like make. And for some reason, the way I said it cracked you up. And I remember when I came behind the monitor after you were like, Jamie, you're funny. You should know that you're a funny actor. I was like, I am cool. <laughs> it's just stuck with me. It's something oh, that like good. meant a lot to me clearly. Cause I still remember it so well. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's I'm glad to hear that. Um, was it in the <laughs> Soprano house? One of those scenes? Yeah. Party scenes yes. or something? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it must. I think it was his first scene when the kids, he was bringing the kids over and they were jealous of the house. It was that yeah, one. They had the pool. They're like, yeah. The now Carmella's parents were there. We're all in the mm. kitchen. Yeah. Right. Now I remember. Yeah, yeah, I did write that episode. Yeah. <sighs> Rob still not that. haven't watched it. You, you haven't watched it yet? No. No. I For a lot of reasons, I just don't. You I still haven't watched any of it. Wow. No. If, if I have kids one day or whatever, but I, I think, um, so this is probably going to come out the same day that I did uh, Talking Sopranos, your podcast. And one of the things I brought up to you was like legitimately one of the most memorable moments in my life of the last however many years, five years, 10 years, whatever, was at the 20 year anniversary of Sopranos we were standing on the stage and like there was a question and answer thing and everybody was walking off the stage and me and you were kind of like the last people on the stage and you were looking off the stage and I was like, what's going on? And you were like, I'm just sad that we're not going to be together again tomorrow. Yeah. You know, and it was just such a like, you know, because I think it's because, this was like the only thing I ever did. So to me, of course, it's the greatest. And I always think about how lucky we were and this, but to hear, you know, it's like, obviously I think you're unbelievable. I look up to you. I, and to hear you say it just puts like, it, 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 it no, like it just, it gives me even more confidence in the place that it is in my heart of like, yeah, this was just, it was just the best. Yeah, no, that's true. And it was, you know, it's bittersweet looking back at it, you know, because it's uh, so many happy memories. I had so much fun um, and just, it, I always say it was like walking down the corner and hanging out with your friends every day. That's how it felt. Oh, yeah. And, and, and with the crew as well. Um, and it's, I don't, I don't really watch myself anymore. I, I stopped kind of after The Sopranos. I stopped really watching my work. And um, because part of me is like, actually, it's the experience of doing it is what I take with me, you know, remembering the work and the people I worked with and, you know, having the experience or wherever it was, if I went to another state or another country, you know, that's enough for me. Like, I don't have to, because inevitably I'll look back and go, ah, <laughs> I remember when I started doing movies, 
Um, the first few movies you do, you know, the first few years, it's a big experience finally to be doing movies. You know, I started acting school after high school and it was five years till I got that one line in a movie. So when, when I started doing movies consistently, it was a big deal for me. And then you'd go and see it. And it's like all this work you did and the whole experience was just so big. And then you see it cut together and you're like, cause this experience for you is so much bigger than it is kind of yeah. condensed on the screen. And I, and I, and I remember getting so disappointed all the time. Mm. Mm. Totally. Some of the Sopranos, I didn't feel that as much, I guess, because I just, I don't know. I liked it so much. I'm not really sure, but it's, um, it's not always the most pleasurable thing, you know? Sometimes the job is more pleasurable than looking at it, looking at your work. So how did you feel about Sopranos ending when it did? Were you ready for it to end or were you sad then or? Uh, both. I was ready for it to end. I think better to end it while it's still like really amazing than like, you know, it's like, like Muhammad Ali stayed as, you know, boxed a little too long. His last couple of fights, he, he got really hurt and he wasn't really that, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. he stayed, he stayed too long. You know, I mean, his career is still amazing and you look at the old fights and they're incredible, but you know what I mean? I'm, I'm kind of glad that didn't happen to us because, you know, we went out and we were still like incredible, you know? So yeah, I, I, sorry, I think, I think that's a great point. I mean, that's part of, part of the reason why, you know, breaking bad is just so good. And, and, there's, um, and, and to a point Seinfeld and, you know, all these kinds of shows and there's something to be said to have that sort of like that respect enough for the show to know when to hang it up and to know when to say when, and it's really, it's such a rare thing. Um, I think there's a little bit more of that happening now since everyone and their mother seems to be making content and all that. But, um, to do that back then, I think was so special, and um, it's 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 a huge reason why I think there's so much life of the show still. There's there's a you know such a a, a hardcore cult following for the show um, because it went out on such a great note, and there wasn't time or there wasn't extra episodes for it to just become total and utter shit, and for people to stop enjoying it. Um, I'm not saying that's what happened to Game of Thrones, but that's kind of what happened to Game of Thrones. You know, it, it's, there was, it just should have ended in a different way. Um, and because of that, there's all this resentment people have towards it. And it's, uh, and it, and it takes sort of the, the, the life out of the fan base a little bit. So I mean, it's really, it's really cool. And I imagine being part of that is a great feeling. Although the, our, the ending of Sopranos, the, rubbed a lot of people the wrong well, way. Well, yeah, but back, I mean... Back in the day when it first happened. Yeah. yeah. So I remember all the hubbub about it, but I, I still consider it one of the best endings. And I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, it's oh, yeah. so unexpected. And people are so used to closure, you know? And David just, that's not his thing so much. You didn't really get it at all on the show. There would be people that, what about the guy, the Russian running in the woods? We never right. found out, right? He could that, still be running. That's, that's, the, that's a great example. Oh, even like the episode Employee of the Month when Mel Melfi got raped and everyone thought, oh, t Tony's going to avenge yep. this and get this guy. And then that doesn't happen at all. There's no, right. there isn't that, you know, satisfaction that, that the, you know, the characters want and also the audience wants. And, and there's something amazing about that because think about it. What could have possibly happened in that ending that would have satisfied everybody? Like wh what could they have done if he would have got shot in front of you all, if you would have got shot by mistake, like in Godfather three, would that have been satisfied? You know what I mean? It's like, right. If he shot Phil Leotardo outside the diner or something, I mean, there's no, it's very hard to think what would have, satisfied people more than that but yeah. i think people have grown to appreciate it I, I i think it was just a shock yeah in the moment because people had been with it so long and the build up and this is the last season and here's the last show and what's going to happen and boom yeah and it's crazy how angry people get also about that because it's like if i told you a story for 30 minutes and 
all of it was amazing, but you didn't like the ending, you'd be like, oh, it was a, it was, you, you en- I enjoyed that story where I feel like, I remember when Sopranos ended, like the anger people had who yeah. didn't like it. It was so, it was like, it's such a small part of a 10 year thing, you know, that, that they liked so much before. And then yet, you know, I, they just, I don't know. It's, it's kind of strange to me. That's only got to, you can only really consider that flattery, right? When people are so upset, right. you know, it just shows how invested they are. And I mean, it's, it's, why would you care otherwise? You know, it's, it's, right. uh, it's nice. It's nice to know that you can piss off people to that magnitude because they cared enough. It is nice. Yeah. I think so. And it took a lot of guts for, I think, for David to, to decide to do that because he knew it would be controversial, I'm sure. Yeah. For sure. So speaking of endings, this is how, this is the list. I, Jamie, don't start crying when I read this list. Oh, God. Uh, this is just a list of all the ways Michael has died in a movie. <laughs> and I didn't even put all of them. Like, I didn't put Sopranos. I didn't put uh, a couple of them. But, like, so obviously, Goodfellas, you get shot. Dead presidents, your intestines get cut out. Basketball Diaries, leukemia. Uh, the movie Last Man Sam, you get shot to death by my people, the Irish, which I'm sorry, we, you know, are, are, uh, Tempers get the best of us sometimes. And I got shot like 50 times. <laughs> yeah. Just like, yeah, endless, like Sonny in The Godfather. The movie The Call, you get stabbed to death with a screwdriver. Uh, old boy, you get choked to death with a wire, and then your tongue gets gift wrapped. Uh, and then the saddest, I found the saddest of all, in Shark Tale, you get crushed by a crane playing a shark. How do, are you going to, do you talk to a therapist <laughs> yeah, I've been killed 25 times in movies in my life. Is there any, yeah. like, that's crazy. You and Michael Bean. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I mean, maybe I it's like, I've ever know, done. means I'll have a long life somehow. I don't know. Yes. It, getting it all, get, getting it all out in the fantasy world. So mm-hmm. I can stay in the real world for a long time. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's, I think it's always, I mean, it, it kind of helps you to be memorable in a movie when you wind up getting killed, you know? I mean, if you think about like, think about like Godfather, Goodfellas, the scenes you remember, a lot of the scenes you remember the most are like when people get killed and stuff. Yeah. You know? um, so I don't know what that means. I don't really, I don't try to overanalyze it, but uh, I think The Sopranos, if I'm not mistaken, might have been the first time I killed someone on screen. I might be wrong. I'm not really sure, but um, in the in the pilot, don't quote me on that. But <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, you wrote your first novel, right? Yeah, I started writing in 2013. I think it took me almost three years. Not. Oh, you know, when I was away on location doing movies, I didn't work on it. I only worked on it when I was at home, not working on other projects. And it's called The Perfume Burns His Eyes? Yeah, that's a lyric from a Lou Reed song. And when, so what's, what's the moment where in your life you finally go, okay, I'm writing a book? Um, you know, I started writing not not long after I started acting, but... I didn't finish anything until Summer of Sam, which was about 10 years of writing. And I, and, um, and then, and a lot of it was fiction, you know, prose, not, not just screenplays, but I just didn't know what I was doing. I never, I never studied it. And, um, I didn't know what I wanted to say, but, um, I just, I read a lot of novels. I mean, I do probably do that more than I do any anything else really it's it's a big love of mine it has been for 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 a lot of my life and i and at some point i started reading novels trying to figure out why i liked it why i would like certain writers what they did what about their storytelling you know um because i don't have a huge command of the english language you know I, i didn't go to college i don't i don't have that kind of education so i had to learn how to write like I speak or think that that was so I, I, I would connect to writers who wrote like 
they were thinking or they speaking, you know, rather than somebody who's just a whiz with the language and who can just, you know, come up with all this wordplay and intricate kind of construction of sentences. More like, you know, just from the gut. And then it was, you know, trying to figure out this. Uh, all right, if we want to write a book, well, what's the story? And in 2013, my my son, my Dean was 16, and he was going through 16 year old difficulties. And I was just trying to relate to being 16 again. So I started writing a story about a 16 year old. And like I said, it in the mid 70s in New York. I was not a teenager in the 70s. Um, till like the late seventies, but not in the mid seventies. Uh, uh, but I just liked that time period. And then three months into the writing, Lou Reed died. And, and I had got, he, Lou Reed was a big hero of mine for a, a lot of my life. And then and I got to know him the last dozen years, we were friends. So his death hit me in a lot of ways as a fan, mm-hmm. as an artist, as a, as a friend. And then I had this idea of putting Lou in the story. And then it really kind of came together, you know? And I, I started the book writing, like there was a boy and he lived in Queens and he, his father died, you know, like from the third person. And then I couldn't get anywhere. It was too difficult. And then I started writing it as a journal as it was the kid. I was born in Queens in 19 and then my father died. And that's when I was able to like do it. So I found the voice basically. Yeah. So when, when you're writing, a book, how far into writing do you decide like, all right, I'm going to let the first person read some of this. And who do you, who do you ask first? I didn't let anyone read it until it was finished. So for three years, nobody saw what I was doing <laughs> and I quit. I, I gave up on it a couple of times and just thought it was really, really hard when it's good. It's like nothing else. It's like when your imagination just, is just popping and and things just come to you and visions and images just come out of nowhere it's amazing but when it's when it's not it's horrible um so you know victoria my wife read it was the first person to read but it was when i was done and were you nervous about asking her to read it or i was you know because who the hell knows i mean you know you spend three years on something and you think it's i mean i thought it was good i guess but you know who knows and um you know she really liked it uh, you know i thought you know she really understood what i was trying to do with it um and um no it's something i think i'm probably m- most proud of that out of anything i've ever done just because it's i mean it's not a biography by any means but it's very personal in a lot of ways you know and, uh, yeah i would I would imagine sharing your work, like sharing your writing is probably, you know, has more weight than anything because it is so, it is, it is so personal. It's just, and it's, yeah, fiction's a very, per, you know, books are very personal thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, again, Vonnegut, this interview I read yesterday, he said, you know, it's the only art form where the audience has to be a performer. Mm. Right. Because mm. they read it and then they, they are creating their own images in their head. You know, yeah. you're just describing something, but they're seeing whatever they're, they're not seeing exactly what you saw. They're seeing their own. So it's, a, they have to really, really participate. A movie, you just sit there and the images come to you and the sounds come to you and you process it that way. But a book, you have to make the images, the audience. And so in that way, you know, and you spend a lot of time with a book when you read it for the most part, days or hours or weeks, you know, as, as a reader. And it really kind of becomes part of you in a way. It's a very intimate exchange, I think. It's yeah. probably a great way to look at it too when you're a writer, because then if somebody doesn't like your book, you're like, oh, you're just a terrible performer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I got to keep that in mind. It's always going to be power back. you don't like what you do. That's, that's another thing I've learned. So did, did it at all help you understand or get sort of um, any empathy around what your son was going through mm-hmm. as a 16-year-old? Yeah. I mean, did, did, yeah, I mean what, what did you have any realizations there? Yeah, just, you know, being a teenager is very hard. Adolescence and becoming a man because you're, you want to be a man, but you're not a man, and you are in some ways, and you're, you know, going through puberty, and your body's changing. And I think one of the common traits or, you know, 
feelings of adolescence is, is like feeling inadequate, feeling like you're not good enough, feeling like, I, I mean, I think everybody goes through those feelings and they're really hard, you know? Yeah. Um, so the things that get you through that time become really important. Like the things that got me through that time are things that I still, I still have a, a very fond and a very sacred place for, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's comic books. <laughs> yeah. I like comic books too. I did when I was a kid. I, I still do. Well, yeah, that, that kind of leads into, um, I wanted to find a way. I was like, I like to ask people what their thoughts are on aliens and things like this. If we can go severely off topic. Then I looked and saw that you're actually in project blue book, the show mm -hmm. and project blue book is a scripted show on the history channel. That's, um, based on this guy, J Allen Hynek, who was, um, in charge of investigating UFOs. The government tasked him with this and his goal was to debunk UFOs because this was like after Roswell and all these things were happening. And then he ends up becoming, um, uh, not a skeptic, but a believer. And, um, it's, it's a pretty fascinating, I could talk a whole podcast just about that, but do you, and, and, I, and you're on the show, um, as well. Do you believe in that kind of stuff? Are you into things, um, that are like out of this world or, um, alien, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much there and I always like to see what people's responses are because, um, it lets me know kind of how, yeah you know, what wild you can be. When I did Project Blue Book, I went out to dinner with the showrunner, I guess. I think he's a showrunner. The first night I got up to Vancouver and that was the first thing I asked him. I said, so you did all this research on this. What do you think? Are there aliens? He was like, absolutely. A hundred percent. Totally convinced from the research and the people he's talked to. Um, you know, I mean, like the footage that the, you know, what is it, NASA, or whoever, or the Air Force or the Pentagon's yeah, releasing. Maybe. I mean, that stuff yeah, is, it, I don't know what that stuff, I mean, I wish it was, it's, it's hard to make any claims from that stuff. I mean, I think so much of what UFOs are, are experimental aircrafts that different, different countries have. You know, I, I live in Santa Barbara and Vandenberg Air Force Base is, is up the coast like an hour or so or two mm -hmm. hours. And I see weird shit flying around there all the time. And it's like, it's, I know what it is. It's experimental shit that they have, right. you know, drones and stuff like that. That looks really weird at night. Um, you know, probably, I mean, I think there's definitely I'll take life it, dude. out there. I'll take probably. <laughs> I, there must be life out there. I also think though that history, the history of humanity how it really went down is very different than how we think it went down. Oh, I agree 100% mm. with you know? that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to yeah, think yeah. that we know what people were doing like 5,000 years ago, we have a little bit of an idea based on things we've found and, you know, things that have been left, but we also have no idea. You know? yeah. No clue. No clue. And human, the human race was probably wiped out 12,000 years ago by uh, a, a cataclysmic event. So we had to like restart. So who knows what happened before that? Um, look, I, that, that answer works for me and the probably is great. And I appreciate that. Um, there's another show that I watched during quarantine that I, I absolutely loved. And then when you came on, I think the seventh or, uh, it was later in the later seasons, uh, Californication, I thought you added such a cool vibe to the show. And in going back to our conversation about you being a writer, I mean, you played a head writer of a, of a TV show on Californication. What was working on that show like for not just a few episodes, but I think almost the full entire season, 11, 12 episodes. So much fun. Um, so I mean, it, it seemed, it seems like to me, David Duchovny is just like one of the funniest great. Uh, people to be around and just, I mean, yeah. He's, he's great. Smart. Very good. Really good actor. Very smart dude. I think he's written three novels or four, maybe. He's 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 quite a writer, actually, and uh, and a good one, and a great guy to be around, and just fun. And he, you know, he's relaxed and and likes to laugh. Um, that was a so much fun, just ridiculous. And um, yeah, my character was a showrunner 
it was basically kind of like Beverly Hills Cop, like becoming a series, you know. So I'm the showrunner, and the all the writers that they that they hired to be in the writers' room with me were stand up comedians. They're all really. comics, yeah, because I know a couple of them. They're very yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was um, it was a blast, uh, and and the character was so unhinged and paranoid and out of control. It was, you know, it was great. That's I, a I good really, show. Yeah, great show. So the the last thing I wanted to ask you, and thank you so much for doing uh, our show, was like now you said you live in California now. Was it hard for you to leave New York? Um, actually, now I live in both places. I Like about a year and a half ago, I got a place in New York again. I didn't have a place in New York for a number of years, but my family lived there. So I never really left because I was always there a lot. Yeah. Um, and I was, I'm been living in Santa Barbara. I never work in Santa Barbara. So I'm on the road a lot, you know, like all over the country and out of the country. Often I was in Puerto Rico for almost a year. I was in Europe for a while. I was in Canada a bunch and LA a bit. So every time I work, I'm gone. You know? um, when we were doing the Sopranos, my kids were young babies born, you know, and, and, and being born and stuff, but I was home all the time. You know, I'd come home after a day's work. Um, and that, that was really great, you know, and kind of spoiled me. Uh, at least when I started ha having to travel a lot, they were a little older and now they're all adults. So my youngest is going to college this year now in the fall. So now we have a lot more flexibility, you know, to, be in New York yeah. more. I'm probably going to be in New York a lot more. I mean, I, um, you know, it's home in a way. You grow up there, your roots are there. It never really leaves you. So I, yeah. I can't really stay away too long. Yeah. As a New Yorker, I always hate admitting that I'm not there. Even if it's for like a vacation, I, I just hate, I hate being away from, uh, from home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was young, I, I mean, there were years when I, I don't think I left at all. Like, N not at all when I was in my 20s and stuff. When I got older, I realized, okay, because it's a very intense place. We run so many people all the time, very concentrated, very, you know, confrontational. I don't mean negative confrontation. I just mean you're interacting with people all the time. Yeah. So as you get older, at least I found I needed to not be in that all the time because it's, um, you know, having peace and quiet is a good thing. But then like San Barbara, New York, are like completely opposite. San Barbara is a little town. It's natural beauty. It's really quiet. I live in this little Valley. I mean, it's, and New York, you know, I live in West 75th street. So it's like the yin and yang. And I like both of those things. I was going to say, you get the best of both worlds. That's, that's, that's the dream right there. Yeah. And now I'm at the age when I can, do that and enjoy that right. yeah i feel like the uh, moving to california now it's like i hear a loud noise i jump or when i'm like sleeping and there's light i can't sleep it's like in new york I, nothing phased me I, yeah. well, I know they're just so like you know like my i just like one of my friends who i only knew from california uh came with me to new york and he said, like, the first person I spoke to in New York, I spoke completely differently than the two years he knew me in California, you know? Like, he's just like, you're... And I'm like, yeah, because I know what they're coming with. Like, you know, I know they're about to come at me with some shit and be trying to go, like, you know, they're sizing you up. They were in California. It's just very, like, you know, if somebody's talking to you, like, they almost... It's like, they need something or, like, what, like, what you don't just... We're in New York. It's like, you're constantly this forced interaction all the time, you know? And it was just, we were in uh, an Uber and we went to go up a street and the person was like, oh, uh, it's cross town is closed because there's a parade. So I was like, well, which way can we go? Uh, what street can we go cross town on? And she was like, it's closed. And I was like, yeah, thanks. Like, <laughs> it's just like, where did, he's like, I knew you for so long. I never saw that. He was like, we, you haven't even gotten to your apartment here. And you're just, and I'm like, you have to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you, when you, when you meet people who can maintain a real sense of serenity and calm and kindness, 
in a place like New York, you know, it makes it even makes them even more exceptional in a way, right? Because mm-hmm. in the midst of all that, to 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 maintain that kind of equanimity and equilibrium is is is, is a feat, you know. Yeah, and there's lots of it, you know. I, did, I, I didn't grow up around a single person like that, so I don't know. Yeah. No, but in the, in, but you see how people, you know, like now when when there's yeah. tragedies happening, disasters, how people, you know, people. People are very brave and giving and courageous and selfless. You know, New Yorkers have that spirit. I mean, we find that all over the place. But, um, you know, after 9-11 was a great example of that, you know, how the city came together, how people, you know, just took action. And and I know that's happening now as well, all over the place. But New York's a special place. It's a big, big city with lots of people. It really is. Michael, thank you. And I also want to thank you for not having a Twitter. Uh, I really, I really find that. Um, I have Instagram though. Okay. All right. Well, that's uh, Look, you got to have Instagram. I got Instagram a couple of months ago. Yeah. It's been very good for the, uh, you know, because I do a lot of like my own stuff, like indie stuff, readings and events and stuff. It's great. What's yeah. your Instagram? Real Michael Imperioli. Real Michael Imperioli. You have a podcast called Talking Sopranos. There's a Twitter Talking Sopranos with that you There's do. There's a fake you. Michael Imperioli who's like tries yeah. to hustle people for stuff. <laughs> Not kidding. Well, have him take him down. That's that's false yeah. and and impersonation. It's his name, fake Michael Imperioli. Like yours is no, name. no, no, no. That yeah, would, couldn't that be amazing? <laughs> that's what my name should be. Yeah, <laughs> and people are still falling for it. Yeah. Right. So thank you so much for doing. It was this. great to meet you. Thanks again. Thank nice you so you. much. So good to see you always. Always take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hey, hit that subscribe button and uh, follow us on Instagram at Pajama Pants and email at Pajama Pants, askpajamapants at gmail.com. And then Jamie at Jamie Lynn Sigler. You won't find Rob anywhere. And uh, that's it. We'll see you next week. Love ya. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching the show. We just wanted to take a second and thank Michael Imperioli and also uh, thank Manscaped for being our very first sponsor. And if you guys want to support them, they support us. Go to manscaped.com. Put in the promo code PJPANTS for 20% off your first order and free shipping. Uh, So thanks, Manscaped, and we'll see you next time.